we're good. Um, so here we are. This this is a quote that I found that I think very nicely encapsulates what I, the message I want to convey to you today. So the uh, one-legged unicorn is also a really nice metaphor for the likely outcome of some projects, especially those whose initial requirements are of the uh, double rainbow variety. Um, so where do things go so wrong on our projects? Well, most of our projects that we work on can be very technically complex, um, but that's generally the thing that is of least concern. It's more the uh, raft of commercial pressures that we're subjected to and misguided requirements that we sometimes get from our clients and stakeholders that really trips us up on projects. So if you combine this with the input that's also required from all the different people of varying skill sets that we have on our teams, you've got the making of a very challenging project. So how do you deal with such a uh, challenging set of circumstances and deliver your project successfully? Well, you'd think we'd know by now, but um, clearly we don't. Uh, a lot of projects don't go very well. So as you can see from this study, which has run for about 21 years and studied 50,000 different software projects um, of all shapes and sizes, you can see from the data that the majority of the projects are either challenged or they fail, completely fail outright. One thing I did want to mention up front today is that I'm not here to evangelise about Agile. Uh, Agile projects have their own problems that you can see from the data in the previous study. So a lot of them are still challenged and also fail. But as you can see from this, it's definitely worse for their waterfall counterparts. So with the odds seemingly stacked against us as project managers, what do the traditional projects project managers do as a formula for success on their projects? Well, this is what a lot of them re revert to. So they do this and they stick to it by exerting control over all the factors they think need to be controlled on a project and might have an effect on their ability to complete the project on time and, and on budget and in line with the original specifications. So this model of centralised control, as we refer to it, is really not a healthy approach. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today. And I really think this is one of the main contributing factors that leads to projects becoming very challenged, as we saw before, or, or actually failing. So in order to explore this in a little bit more detail, we'll start by looking at the role of the project manager, what things look like when they're too controlling, discuss how they need to distribute this control a lot more broadly across the teams that they work with, and in the process, transition themselves from being a manager to more of a leader. Also outline the environmental factors at play and the sort of business structures that influence the behaviour of the project manager and have a real bearing on how they relate to those around them. We'll look at moving from more of a hierarchical model to a much flatter one. We'll also look at the mindset of the project manager and how this really heavily influences the mindset of those around them and the teams that they work with. I want to highlight how they need to move away from a fixed mindset towards one that's much more open to learning and challenges. And then finally, finish by having a look at the culture that is an outcome of this sort of behaviour and the varying levels of control that are exerted upon the projects that we work on. And then look at seeing how we can move from seeing projects as a money-making process machine um, to them much more as a living organism that requires a lot of attention and care. So controlling project manager. So who are these people? Well, there's this one. <laughs> if you hadn't worked that out, that's a picture of me. So um, that's back in 2006, and what I'd probably consider the peak of my own benevolent dictatorship. Um, I'd recently comp completed a certification as a project management professional, and I'd even got myself elected to the local board of the uh, Project Management Institute in Sydney. So I was, I was a very proud project management practitioner and at the same time um, proudly acknowledged that I was a control freak. So I thought and honestly believed at the time that that was a really good quality to have as a project manager. 
Uh, it also convinced myself that my competency as a project manager was definitely due to my attention to detail and my extensive knowledge of, of the standards that I just learned about and my ability to be in control of every situation on every project that I worked on. So I was delivering projects on time and on budget, mostly, and as far as I concerned, I was concerned everything was all good. But it wasn't that great at all, so it was actually very stressful, and I realised that in order to achieve the sort of perceived successes that I was having on projects, I had spent the majority of my time poring over documentation and plans, making sure that everything I was doing was adhering to those original plans. Um, so it wasn't long after this that I'd, I had a bit of an awakening. And rather than continue down this path of professional development that I'd chosen and been undertaking for many years, keeping to extolling the virtues of the different project management standards that I'd been, become accustomed to and been indoctrinated into, I really started to question the, the whole approach. So I guess what I'd like to look at is, well, what changed? Well, one thing I did realise that the only re reason that my projects were successful was I was actually very good at communicating with the people that I was working with and always made sure that clients knew where we were up to and that the team had all the information they needed, keeping the flow of information going right throughout the project and all the parties on the project had, um, as long as everybody was adhering to the plans and specs, it was great. So the thing was, though, what I realised was was still all about me. And working on these projects really wasn't that much fun. So it was certainly all very well intentioned. My intentions for the interest of the project were, were, were right. Um, but as I alluded to a lot earlier, uh, it, was, it was still very much a benevolent dictatorship. So ultimately every project was, was an ego-driven exercise that was used to inflate the importance of my own role on the project. And I strongly believe that in the absence in my absence on the project, that the whole thing would collapse. So, and that was probably right, but realistically I'd set it up that way. So I always also obsessively looked for, for ways to improve the process on the projects and make everything much more predictable and repeatable. I mean, the question I used to ask myself was how hard could it be to build a website? And it was basically the same process every time. We work out a content structure, we do some designs, we add the content, build a few pages, and then we launch it. It really didn't need to be that hard. Um, so that might have been true, say, 10 years ago, when I was originally in this kind of mindset. And to some, respect for, to some respects, it's still true today on some projects. But these were marketing-driven websites, but they were rapidly evolving into very functionally rich Web applications, content management systems were getting much more sophisticated in order to support them, and the requirements on projects were becoming a lot more bespoke. So it took a long, it took a bit of time to realise it, but ultimately we entered into the realm of what was product development. So I guess at some point here I'd reached a bit of a tipping point and knew that I'd had to make a change. Um, didn't really know what that change should be. But I came up with a very brilliant strategy to deal with it. And that was I quit my job. <laughs> so um, fortunately, I'd been tinkering around on the side for a little while. Um, actually building, of all things, a, my own proprietary content management system. <laughs> because, of course, at, at the time, that's exactly what the world needed. It was another CMS. Um, but realistically, a lot of them were, were complete rubbish. And they were very expensive, or both. and. Um, it turned out to be a, a reasonably good idea and kept me gainfully employed for a few years. So during this time, I got a lot of exposure to, to product development. So I really became, I really came to appreciate the iterative nature of producing something that evolves over time and something that you really spend, rather than spend an inordinate amount of time specking things out right from the start, you, you work very iteratively through the, the product development cycle. And I got to look at this through the sort of, I guess, the eyes of project management and, and the experience that I'd had for, for many years. So fast forward a few years and multiple scrum, water scrum fall, whatever iteration of various project management methodology you want to look at, and other agile approaches, um, what have I learned? Well, I know for sure that it's not 
focusing on the pro on the process that makes a project su successful or enjoyable, and it's much more about focusing on the people that you're working with. So making compromises and sharing the ex experience together, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So it's a little like going travelling together and working out your itinerary as you as you go, as opposed to being the board guide, board tour guide, just leading a, a bunch of uninterested tourists around on the same tour day after day. You know, m maybe you book a couple of nights to start with, uh, just to be safe, and but then you work together and base your plans on a general idea of, of where you're going. And generally, those experiences that you have, like a travel experience, is much more engaging and much more interesting by the time you get to the end of it. Everybody's got a lot more out of it. So in this context, I still see um, the role of the project manager as a person who's done a bit of travelling around this area that you're in. They've, they, they, they know where, where they're going, they know what they're doing, and, and their, the idea is that they help the group navigate their way around. You need to be much more of a, a tour leader than a tour guide. So your, your role is also to help solve the problems along the way. You don't necessarily have to be the one who has all the answers, but you definitely step in where there's a problem, and you're the one who facilitates a way to solve this problem. Uh, you also want the group to get along with each other, of course. So your role's about ensuring that the relationships are built between the team and that they're, very, and that they're healthy. You, you want people to, to share ideas and develop a common language that will ultimately benefit the outcome. You, ju you, just don't, you don't want to be just an interpreter on a project. You also want to encourage people to con contribute their ideas and, and, and challenge the decisions that are being made. You don't want the team to be just a bunch of followers and go along with a set plan. It should be everyone's right to contribute and be heard along the way if they have something to add. So most of all, you want people to feel empowered and contribute beyond their role in the group. So you really want to create an environment where people are willing to volunteer and take on roles and tasks that really streamline the progress of the project rather than relying on, making, relying on you to make something happen or pass along the, the relevant information. So I guess the question is, why do you bother with all of this and why don't you just stick to the, the idea of Gantt charts and specifications? Um, well, I, I strongly believe that it's actually, it can, can be quite rewarding to, to take this approach. And I've certainly got a much more meaningful relationship with the people that I work with and the relationship with the clients that I work with as well. And so I think it, it really is uh, a, a great approach and a much more inclusive approach Probably one of the best examples that I have recently in the last few years uh, at Previous Next, where I'm at now, is that we, we started setting up uh, a Teams-based model a few years ago. And we wanted to move much more to this collaborative kind of working environment with each other. And one of the first things we, do, we did was try and identify technical leads within the teams. And we talked to some of our more senior developers and we said, you know, we want you to take on this role and we want you to start, you know, taking a bit of a lead on, on the projects and working through the requirements and working with the rest of the team on developing the solution. And the response that we got um, on a couple of occasions, but one person I remember in particular was that they, they said to me, I don't want to be a project manager. And, and that was that. They, they didn't quite comprehend the idea of what the team lead was about and what we were trying to do. So... Ultimately, what we did was just kind of back off. We, we pushed down that path of, of still creating a team-based model, but we just sort of let it ride for a little bit and adopted some of these approaches that I was talking about. And what's happened over time is rather than sort of force this idea on to these people who were uncomfortable with it in the first place and thinking that it was actually taking on the role of a project manager, was they've come to realise that that's not what it was at all. And... In the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of our senior developers really step up and take on, and actually take on discrete projects of their own, literally to the point where I, I barely have any contact with the client throughout the course of the project. So that's a really good thing. It's been great for the projects. It's been really good for the team, and it's been it, we get some really good outcomes for the clients as well. So what sort of environment creates this sort of controlling behaviour with project managers? 
So the standard um, kind of operating model for businesses is one that's fairly hierarchical and very management driven. So any project manager who's operating in this environment um, plays a really big part in influencing the way that you approach your projects. So some client organisations that you work with um, have a very similar effect um, and influence and on the way that the project manager can operate. They might be operating in the sort of way that I'm trying to describe today, but they're imposing a very traditional or hierarchical model on the project and the project manager, which makes it very difficult for them. So um, while the client might be very engaged in the whole project, um, they're very, very heavily influenced by the, the management forces at play and, and the, the model that they have to work within. So one of the other very big things that we find is a huge problem in trying to be a lot more flexible and I guess a lot more agile in these projects is the procure procurement process that we have to go through with our clients. So they're asking us for a very prescriptive response to a very, um, very specific set of requirements and uh, a lot of their proposals are like this double rainbow vision that I was talking about before. And then they put in place a contract that dictates the terms that you have to work within and you have to try and stick to all of these specifications that are in, in place. And if you don't tackle that right up the front of the project, that just has this roll-on effect right through the rest of the project and, and becomes a, an, an instrument of control throughout the project. So I'm not suggesting that any of these project managers on either side of the equation with the clients or in our team are inherently bad people. They're all trying to undertake these things with the right intentions at the start of the project, but they do end up much more, or they tend towards a much more controlling type of behaviour in order to appease the will of this organisation that they're working for in a very hier hierarchical and traditional structure. So one thing that we also find now is that like I mentioned before, we're dealing with client organisations who still work within this very traditional model where we're trying to be a lot more agile and a lot less controlling in the way that we're pro approaching our projects. And then we end up with this clash of clash of cultures, essentially, a clash of, clash of environments in working together. So what, what tends to happen is that we try and coach the client through or we set up uh, the structure at the beginning that's kind of less hierarchical and we try and take the project team into a much flatter kind of structure but it, it really seems to influence a lot of the behaviour right throughout the project and we, and we find that um, by the end of the project we still have a, a lot of people who are very weary and very over it, kind of the, the, the same sort of experience that I had years ago when, when we were running projects based on Gantt charts and, and specifications. Um, what we have found though, again, is if you really take some small steps and try to introduce some of these ideas into the project and to the client and, and sell them in on the benefits of being less kind of hierarchical and controlling about the, the projects, that by the end of the project they definitely have learnt things. Um, and a, a very recent project that we did was exactly like this where we'd set up a, um, well they had set up a very strict contract and a very defined set of requirements. We tried to introduce a, an agile methodology into the project and coach them through. Everybody was very enthusiastic about it at the beginning. But as we went through the project, these you know, management forces I was talk talking about before um, just kept, I guess, eating away at, at, at the model that we were trying to build and constantly using things like the contract as a, as a, as a weapon to try and um, you know, keep us on track. Suffice to say, we did get to the end of the project, we delivered on time and reasonably within budget, but everyone on our team was, was completely over it and the client was over it as well. So um, we did learn things, it was worth investing the time that we did in trying to get people a little bit more on board with the, the ideas that we had, um, but it was still pretty excruciating by the end of it. So what is a more ideal model? Um, well, one, obviously, with a bit of shared responsibility across the team. It's not just about the project manager. They're not the one who has to shoulder all of the responsibility to, to deliver, deliver the project. And 
Um, it's something you could, I guess you could refer to as a much flatter structure. It's not the hierarchical model I was talking about before. You also want to create a bit of a shared vision. That project I was talking about before, you know, we were trying to establish a shared vision. We do this a lot with a lot of our clients, even while working with, you know, fairly prescriptive requirements and specifications. We want to try and take a little, little bit of a step back um, to almost before what the procurement process was to talk to them about what it is that they're really trying to achieve and then showing them that a lot of their requirements, you know, probably don't really share or don't really relate to this idea of a shared vision. So if you can move much, obviously if you can start that way, it's a much healthier um, place to be and not working to this predetermined set of requirements and specifications. And then that way you've got this shared vision that you can kind of use as, as, a, as a real anchor point right throughout the project. And at any point that people start questioning the approach or trying to referring back to the, uh, some kind of specifications at the beginning, you can use this idea of a shared vision to, to talk that through and come up with a better approach. Um, the better approach is something that I kind of see as, as common sense, really. Um, looking back at the approaches that we were taking years ago around using Gantt charts, and of course people still use today, and specifications, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because there's always a lot of change on projects. Every project you ever do never meets the exact specifications at the beginning. You create this environment where um, you're actually building things that people don't want or they're not likely to use. So if, if, you, if you take that on board, and use common sense really, a lot of this really starts to fall into place. So starting the project as a discovery-led exercise rather than a specification exercise where you spend an inordinate amount of time drawing up designs and creating huge documents that you use as the reference point throughout the project, you actually you start the project, you agree to a, a budget, um, you agree, agree to a general set of, or you agree to your shared vision and a general set of high level requirements and then you go into this phase of discovery where you work together with the client, you work together with the team to really flesh it out. I mean this is obviously a very agile type approach, building up a backlog of work that you're going to work on but you're not doing things or you're not trying to make um, a set of requirements that are highly prescriptive. So once some of these ideas start coming out, you, you can actually start building and prototyping them. So in, in the time that you would be spending building these huge or writing these huge specification documents, you can actually be working on the solution itself. And part of the discovery process can be this idea of prototyping and, and just actually getting in there and starting to build, um, or creating some of, or putting some of your ideas into practice. And on the design front, um, obviously back in the day the approach was to create uh, a set of photoshopped designs that were then um, pixel perfect, or well, the execution was meant to be pixel perfect and again like a lot of functional requirements what you end up with is nothing like the original design that you, that you would give them. So again, our approach is to be a lot more iterative about the design process and starting with a, a kind of a master design approach and working from there. And ultimately what you want to try and do is, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is this idea of continuous delivery. So rather than this start and end to a project, what you really want to be looking at is this idea that you're going to be working together on this solution or this platform for quite a period of time and it's going to evolve and you want to try and get um, get it launched as quickly as possible with the, the most high priority requirements that you've got but then you are going to keep delivering and keep working on this solution together. So that, um, that kind of paints a bit of a picture about the sort of environment that we don't want to be working in and the sort of environment that we kind of aspire to now. So the next concept I want to cover off is the idea of mindset. 
So I touched a little bit on it earlier about what the mindset is of the project manager and how the environmental factors around them have a great influence on their role and, and what part they play in influencing the mindset of the team. And the influence that a project manager can have, whether they be a controlling type project manager or a, a much more open and collaborative project manager, the influence they have on all of the people around them and the mindset of the team around them and the clients that they work with can be huge. I think it's a, it's a, a, a huge amount of influence that they have. Um, so obviously what they do at the start of the project is very important. That really sets the scene for what happens throughout the project as much as the sort of things that go on through the procurement process of, of projects. The way that you set things up generally has a very long lasting effect right through the project and even can, ha can have an effect years later on the relationship that you have with the clients that you're working with. So effectively there's two types of mindset and I think these relate quite nicely to the sort of mindset that you get when you have a, a project manager who's a bit of a control freak and a project manager who is a lot more open and collaborative. So there's two types of, these two types of mindsets can be um, referred to as fixed mindset or a growth mindset and like the levels of control that you or are exerted on a project, um, there's, there's different levels across the spectrum of of mindset, but the general theory is that you're either one, you tend towards one or the other. It doesn't mean that you can't move between between the two or learn to be a more growth oriented sort of person. So um, a controlling project manager obviously has a very fixed mindset. Um, they they do feel very empowered and feel that they know best and that you know, managing projects is their thing and they're kind of the smartest person in the room around how projects should run. Um, they already know how everything should go because they've got a, a very detailed Gantt chart, they've got a huge set of specifications, they've got uh, this document to work from. They already know how it's all gonna go and then they, they set course accordingly. So it ultimately becomes kind of their way or the highway and um, they feel like they've already know all the answers. So if things go beyond their current knowledge or uh, things become too challenging on the project, they tend to get very stressed. So a project manager that's much more open to challenges um, and learn new ways of approaching things as they go through and as, as problems and challenges come up through the project is likely, likely to be far less controlling and help foster a much more positive mindset right across the team. So what are the sort of things that actually define the mindset? Well, while I was preparing my talk, um, I identified a list of keywords that I thought were relevant to the content that I was preparing for, for my talk. And I, I grouped them as what I consider good or bad, um, depending on how they related to this concept of control on a project. Um, for most of them, they were actually pretty easy to group. It was pretty straightforward as to whether it was a bad concept or a good concept. Um, and a few of them stood out, though. And I, I found, well, I looked at them, and in a very unscientific way, I thought this is a really good way to kind of define what someone's mindset is by looking at these words or these keywords that have come up and um, understanding how they would interpret them. So. This is a set of bad keywords that I came up with and what I've highlighted here is um, a number of the, the good and bad activities, the practices, the approaches and the behaviours associated with the different types of working environments um, of a centralised control versus a much more distributed control type model. And you can see here from um, the words that I highlighted, these are the ones that I, I felt really stood out and would be a really good test to put in front of somebody to say, what does this mean to you uh, in context of project management? So you can see um, something as simple as, you know, mistakes or failure, um, are they a good or are they a bad thing? So on a more positive note, um, this is a, a the, the, the better approach and the sort of activities and the description of an environment that's a, a much more um, a much, a much less controlled and much more collaborative type of environment. 
And again, these ideas of these keywords and the way that you look at failure or the way you look at mistakes um, really determines what, what your mindset is. Yeah, sure, sorry. I like reading the book. So, again, um, it, it's a very unscientific conclusion that I've come to, but using something like this as a tool to uh, question your own mindset, question the mindset of the project managers that you work with or the projects that you're working on can be a really useful exercise to identify some of the areas where you want to try and... Um, encourage some change or move a little bit more towards this less controlling kind of behaviour. So the last thing uh, I want to look at is, is culture. And culture is really an outcome of the three other things that we've looked at. So the project manager themselves, the environment that they're operating in, and the mindset that develops um, as a result of their own mindset and the mindset of the team. I think combining all those things together, you end up with a certain culture. So the less desirable culture is something I mentioned before, and that is this idea of projects or businesses or both being just some kind of money-making process machine. And what you have in this sort of environment is two types of people. You have the people who are in control and then the people who are working for them. So this idea of controllers and pleasers, and you know, there's, there's nothing particularly healthy about that type of model. There's only one side of the equation there that really gets anything out of it. Um, but as I you know, alluded to before, even when you are in that controlling mindset, it's really not much fun. Uh, the sort of relationship that you end up having as a project manager with your team, developers, designers, is much more like a parent-child type of relationship. And back 10 years ago, when I was much more in that kind of control freak mindset and had actually recently just had kids, um, I felt that the, the couple of years of experience that I had as a parent was, was some fantastic skill that I had now acquired that allowed me to be a better project manager because this is essentially the relationship that you ended up having with the people around you. It felt like you were managing a bunch of kids. <laughs> but realistically, what I've realised now is that that was more about my mindset than, than the people I was working with. It, it, admittedly, some of them were pretty challenging. <laughs> um, so this idea of failure looking at those keywords before, the way that you interpret failure says a lot about the mindset of the project and the mindset of the project manager. So the, the idea that failure is not acceptable um, is, is, is a very strong indication that you, you're not really in the right frame of mind and you're not really in a very uh, healthy working environment. It's okay, it's okay to fail as long as you, you learn from that and, and you fix the problems. But when, when failure does occur or people make mistakes, um, this is what happens. It's very blame-driven. It's like, who, who made the mistake? What, who, whose fault is this? And um, you try and isolate the problem rather than just moving on. And the working environment in which you're in is riddled with this. It's full of anxiety and pressure to deliver. Um, according to the schedule or within the budget or based on the specifications that you've, you've had laid out. So this is something I kind of occurred to me some time ago and the way that I would describe how these projects go and what this environment is like, what a project is like within this environment. And you, you may or may not have heard of it, it's pretty common. Um, in in movies and theatre, this idea of a three-act structure, and it kind of really nicely describes what a project looks like when you're in this very controlling type environment. So the, the three-act structure, if you don't know it, is there's the setup, then the second act is the confrontation, and then the final act is the resolution. And that 
seems to feel very much like a lot of projects that I've ever worked on or that I've been aware of is that you spend most of your time in this second act in this period of confrontation and working through all the things that um, should have been delivered or according to the specification and then finally to get it across the line at the end you move into this phase of res resolution and everyone sort of agrees and says yep all right well that'll do let's just all get out of here because we're totally over it. So looking at what sort of culture that we really want to have we need to we need to appreciate that what we're working within is, is a living organism. A, a project team is a lot of people. Um, they all have very different personalities. The whole project itself is really just a big living, breathing organism. It's not just this machine that keeps cranking out projects for profit. So we want to move the culture much more towards this idea of a learning focused living organism. So rather than this idea of uh, controllers and pleasers, what we want is a set of co-drivers and navigators. So as a project manager, you want to have co-drivers and you want navigators with you. You don't want to be the one driving the car the whole time and everybody else just following your lead. Um, it reduces the stress on you as a project manager incredibly to get people on board and to get people helping you deliver the project essentially. Um, so back to that example I gave before, now that we've moved a lot more into this culture of having people step up and do what they originally thought was project management, um, takes a huge burden off us as project managers to deliver the project itself. And ultimately everyone is, um, is responsible for uh, getting, to the, getting to the end of the journey. Um, the relationships are, they're much more adult. So this idea of a parent-child relationship, I think, well, I, I can confidently say now it's, it's basically non-existent in the environment that I'm working in and I don't think that way of any of my colleagues or anyone that I work with anymore at all. Um, maybe some of the clients we work with um, can be challenging at times and you might revert back a little bit. Actually, saying that, it is a, there is a good point to be made here, which I'll come to in a minute, is that you will find yourself reverting back. You, you can't ultimately just go from, you know, this idea of a complete co control freak to just completely liberated and letting go of absolutely everything. There are points at which you need to sort of step in and revert a little bit back to that um, that idea of taking control, but you want to you want to let go of it as quickly as possible. So yeah, the idea of working working with your colleagues, working with the teams on a really adult kind of level. And I, I don't mean it just has to be that way for you as a project manager. I mean, everyone has to get on board there. Everyone needs to be grown up about what you're doing. Um, clearly, the idea of failure is something that you accept. Um, back to the idea of this common sense approach, it, it makes sense that you're going to fail. Things are going to go wrong. Um, what we're working with is is complex. Um, fortunately, what we do is not mission critical. It's not life threatening. You know, if something goes wrong with a bit of software, no one's going to die, um, unless of course it's a piece of software on an aeroplane. But um, yeah, so the acceptance of failure is 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 definitely um, part of this culture. And of course, when you make a mistake, you learn from it, you move on. I'm not suggesting that you want to just create this environment where everybody's okay to screw up all of the time and you know you just magically will get there in the end. Um, you want to you want to be sure that everyone is actually learning from these mistakes. And rather than an environment that's full of anxiety and pressure, um, we want to be moving towards this culture of happiness. I mean we all go to work for you know however many hours every week spend a huge amount of our lives there, what's the point really? And unless, unless you're enjoying it, unless you're going to be happy, unless you're creating this culture and environment that, that breeds this, it is actually possible to, to enjoy your work and be happy. I strongly believe that. <laughs> I have my days, but um, you know, that really is the aspiration that everybody should have. And I think that you know, the whole point of talking about what I'm talking today is, is that I really think that um, 
this kind of model, and I'm only looking at it from a project management perspective, but this kind of model really does lead to people being a lot happier on the project. And if you as a project manager can influence that, I think that's something that you can gain a, a huge amount of satisfaction out of. Um, and it's the sort of thing you know get, gets you out of bed in the morning and makes you actually want to go to work. Um, and then finally, in, in this idea of culture, rather than the three-act structure that I mentioned before, what you want to get to, or what this, this sort of culture, is one where you actually achieve a bit of flow. So this concept of flow, where you, you really the whole team is just working together really, really well, and they're producing all this great work, and it, you know it, it just it feels right. It, back to that continuous delivery model, you you just you're not having these different phases working through this kind of really confrontational kind of um, exercise. It is just it just it just works. So um, they're all the concepts that I really wanted to cover off today. And just, just to wrap up, on the idea of control, the idea of a centralised model of control is really not an effective strategy at all. Uh, I don't think it's an effective strategy in business and it's certainly not an effective strategy for projects. You really want this control that you have as a project manager to be distributed right across the team. Everyone needs to have a sense of control across the project. Um, project managers need to be much less managerial. I mean, the title is project manager, but they want to be much more of a leader, project leader than a project manager, and, and much more focused on, on that as their role. Um, projects should really move away from this hierarchical model and uh, <coughs> try and achieve a much flatter kind of structure. I mean, there's a lot of talk, there's always been a lot of talk around these idea of flat structures in business, and they may or may not work for for some companies. But really, what you're trying to the message you're trying to get across there is you just want to create a much more collaborative environment where there isn't this kind of you know I'm the boss, you know you're the worker kind of environment. Um, and I think if you, even if you work within those kind of businesses and you work with clients who are that way inclined or that's their kind of business model, I think you can still move towards this kind of structure on your project. So you kind of isolate the project from the, um, the, the organisation that, that you're working for or working with. And so the idea of culture is to, to focus on this culture that recognises projects and the teams of people that work on the projects as as a living organism, not just this this money making machine that just cranks out projects for the benefit of the business and the profit of those who own them. Um, but as I kind of mentioned before, things you know this is not a perfect model. Things are never perfect on these projects that we work on. Um, a lot of them are still going to be challenging. A lot of them will still fail, even if we try and. Um, you know, exert a little less control as a project manager. So really the aim of my talk today is, is just to be highlighting an out, a very, what I consider a very outdated approach um, to project management and, and highlight an approach that I think is much more compatible with the way that we all work and the sort of projects that we do. So uh, what I would what I would say is that if any of this does resonate with you, you may already be well down the path of, um, of this kind of model of working as a project manager. You may be working with project managers who are still control freaks. Um, or as a project manager, if you're not comfortable kind of throwing away the Gantt charts just yet, I'm not saying that that's something that you have to do. You don't need to throw them away. What you just need to do is take small steps towards um, being less controlling and letting go um, a little more. And I think over time, as I mentioned before, it's taken us, literally taken us years to kind of create this culture and this environment. But at every step of the way, we're referring back to this vision and this idea that we want to be a lot more agile, a lot less controlling, and um, reduce, as project managers, reduce the burden on ourselves to actually be able to deliver these projects more effectively and, and with a bunch of people who are actually happy about it. Um, 
so what I would say is if you're still stuck in that kind of mode of working and you're looking to get out of it, then just sort of have a think about how you want to approach your next project and kind of imagine something that, or well, imagine getting to the end of a project and, and it's being something that people truly value and, and they feel really satisfied with the outcome and, you know, everyone's actually very happy. Um, ultimately, it'll be a lot more enjoyable along the way and, and the experience of the project will be something that, you know, works for everyone. So, um, yeah, again, as a project manager, I think just have a think about the sort of steps that you can take um, towards developing a better culture and developing a better mindset for yourself and then for those around you. Um, and don't underestimate um, the capability that people you work with have. So this idea, again, back to the concept of um, a, a team lead or a technical team lead and someone who thought they were going to be a project manager, well, if we if we just left it there, then um, we we would have missed out on a hell of a lot. So, um, what what these people that we've been working with have been capable of is enormous. Um, it's well beyond what you know probably their original role they thought their original role was, um, but it it really has been very eye opening. So, I, take a step back, relinquish some of the control that you have now. To the, to the people around you and, you know, see how they go, see how they perform. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So distilling this all down into kind of one simple rule to apply across all of this, there's a lot of different things that you can do, as I've outlined today, and a lot of different tactics and strategies and things that you can think about. But I think if you kind of run everything through this kind of filter or this rule... Um, it really, it totally kind of flips the mindset from that idea of a controlling project manager to one who's a lot more open on. The controlling project manager clearly thinks the process is the more, more important thing. The less controlling project manager is far more interested in the people and, and um, focusing on them and getting a really good dynamic going on the project. And just to leave you with one final quote from one of my favourite shows... Um, I strongly believe that this is the case. So, thank you. That's it. So, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Well, I didn't. It was all very waterfall. So back then, it was completely waterfall. Um, but I would say that we we do still struggle now with agile, and like I said before, you, you end up with these clashing cultures sometimes with the clients and organisations that you work with. So um, I think our, the strategy is to just try and introduce um, some of the concepts and the artefacts of agile, and um, try and move it more towards an, an agile approach as opposed to a, a waterfall type project and um, even just little little steps will make a big difference. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, my question is around customer management. So you mentioned that um, you set a leadership value early on in the relationship with your team that failure is okay, mm -hmm. which I think is awesome, by the way, and the way that we should all be doing this. And I'm wondering how, how you translate that value to your customer relationship. So when something goes wrong and your customer is like, who did this? Um, which they sometimes do. What's your answer to that in the face of the customer to make sure that that, um, that sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? That personality of your leadership style translates to them and that they don't go looking for a neck to choke on your team or someone to get like fired, you know? What yeah, you well, I think we... It's not about being defensive, but it's not about um, it's not about taking a step back from clients either. I mean, when they're like that, if, if, if a client is looking for someone to be accountable or someone to blame on that, I think you, we actually, like, you find yourself getting a little bit protective of the teams that you work with. I mean, the whole idea is to just work through it um, and rationalise it with them, spend the time and just make the effort to calm them down, essentially. So and sometimes that's, that takes a lot of time. Um, 
But yeah, I look. That's really the approach is to just try and calm them down. Don't ever, you know, let somebody in your team take the fall for it. And again, it's not about um, making yourself accountable either. So this idea that the project manager is completely responsible for everything and they're the one who should be fired or they're the ones who should be um, responsible for these things is not true either. I think I think if you're dealing with um, dealing with that sort of situation, you're dealing with a pretty difficult person. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has to be pretty dire for us to get to that point. I think, um, well, to be honest, I think if you get to that point with a client, um, you, you've kind of failed a little bit yourself for not um, addressing that earlier or getting to the point. But look, we, we have had the experience with clients where um, you, you get these people who are just difficult and they will never stop being difficult no matter how hard you try. And... Um, but I think to answer your question, it's probably, it has to be pretty extreme to get to that point. I think there's a lot that you can do to prevent that sort of situation. Um, but then again, financially, you need to be protecting yourselves as well to make sure that you're not continuing to you know, add more and more to these requirements that, that they have or these ideas of what you should have delivered compared to the specs and those sort of things. So yeah, I think it, very extreme situation, but... Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was great. Yeah, cheers. Wasn't that after the uh, technology? Yeah, well, that's pretty big stuff. I was sure I had that. I was sure I had that all under control. Well, interestingly, some of them are becoming a bit more agile, or they're starting to adopt agile, so that makes a big difference. Um, actually, I didn't mention there is a client that we just in fact started working.